the Yankutra Nikaya, the Numerical Discourses, Dasaka Nipata, Book of the Tens, Suttas 61 to 70, Yamakavagga, the Twin Section, Avijja Sutta, on Ignorance, Bhikkhus, it is not possible to designate or trace a specific point in time when ignorance suddenly began, as in, before this, there was no such thing as ignorance. Hence, it only manifested after that point in time. Yet, because the fact remains that there is ignorance in the presence of certain conditions. Now, because I declare how even ignorance also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to bring forth the manifestation of ignorance. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for ignorance? The five obstructions, Nivarana, should be your reply. But Bhikkhus, I declare how even the five obstructions also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as a specific condition to bring forth the manifestation of the five obstructions. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the five obstructions? The three types of wrong conduct in one's behavior should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare, even the three types of wrong conduct in one's behavior also do not manifest without having their own requisite condition. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to bring forth the manifestation of the three types of wrong conduct in one's behavior. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the three types of wrong conduct in one's behavior? Not restraining the sensed faculties should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare that not restraining the sensed faculties also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to bring forth the manifestation of not restraining of the sense faculties. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the non-restraint of the sense faculties? Lacking in mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, Sampajanya should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare that the lack in sati and sampajanya also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to bring about the lack in sati and sampajanya. And what is the specific condition that serves as a nourishment for the lack in sati and sampajanya? Unwise radical attention, ayoniso manasikara, should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare that unwise radical attention also does not manifest without having its own requisite condition. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment serving as the specific condition to bring about unwise, radical attention. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for unwise, radical attention? Not possessing strong faith or confidence within the heart should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare that not possessing strong faith or confidence within the heart also does not manifest without having its own requisite condition. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to not possess strong faith or confidence within the heart. 
And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for not possessing strong faith or confidence within the heart? Not paying attention nor listening to the true Dhamma should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare that not paying attention nor carefully listening to the true Dhamma also does not manifest without having its own requisite condition. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to not be paying any attention nor carefully listening to the true Dhamma. And what is the specific condition that serves as a nourishment for not paying attention nor listening to the true Dhamma? Not associating with truly good spiritual friends should be your reply. In this way, bhikkhus, by not associating with truly good spiritual friends, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you neither pay attention to nor carefully listen to the true Dhamma. Thus, by neither paying attention nor carefully listening to the true Dhamma, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you do not possess strong faith or confidence within your heart. And not possessing strong faith or confidence in turn fulfills the necessary conditions whereby you then have unwise radical attention. Because of the presence of unwise radical attention, you would then be fulfilling the necessary conditions for there not to be any mindfulness, sati, nor full awareness of the body, sampajanya. Now due to the fact that there is no sati, and Sampajanya, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you no longer have any restraint over your sense faculties. And because of you not restraining your sense faculties, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions for the three types of wrong conduct to manifest in your behavior. Then, as a result of your behavior, being dictated by the three types of wrong conduct, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions, whereby the five obstructions come to infect your heart and all that you do. Now, in the presence of the five obstructions running your life, then you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions, whereby ignorance manifests and dominates your entire life. Bhikkhus, just as during a heavy thunderstorm, large drops of rain fall on the higher altitudes of the mountains, where the precipitating rainwater comes pouring down, as it keeps sloping its way through the valleys, filling up the small streams, that in turn become bigger streams, and thus fill up the small ponds and the smaller ponds becoming full and becoming larger ponds turn into the rivulets that flow downwards and then they too come to fill up the rivers and then into great rivers flowing all the way into the great ocean filling it up perpetually. So you see, Bhikkhus, how even the great ocean must have its own supportive nourishment which ensures that the necessary conditions are there for the ocean to exist. In just the same manner, because by not associating with truly good spiritual friends, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you neither pay attention nor carefully listen to the true Dhamma. Thus, by neither paying attention nor carefully listening to the true Dhamma, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you do not possess strong faith or confidence within your heart. Not possessing strong faith or confidence in turn fulfills the necessary conditions whereby you then have unwise radical attention. And because of the presence of unwise radical attention, you would then be fulfilling the necessary conditions for there not to be any mindfulness, sati, or full awareness of the body, sampajanya. Now, due to the fact that there is no sati 
and Sampajanya, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you no longer have any restraint over your sense faculties. And because of you not restraining your sense faculties, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions for the three types of wrong conduct to manifest in your behavior. Then, as a result of your behavior being dictated by the three types of wrong conduct, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby the five obstructions come to infect your heart and all that you do. Now, in the presence of the five obstructions running your life, then you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby ignorance manifests and dominates your entire life. However, bhikkhus, I also declare how true knowledge and release also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment serving as the specific condition whereby true knowledge and release manifest by arising within the heart. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for true knowledge and release? The seven factors of awakening should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare that even the seven factors of awakening also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to activate and maintain the seven factors of awakening. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the seven factors of awakening? The four bases for mindfulness practice, Satipatthana should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare how even the four bases for mindfulness practice also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to activate and maintain the four bases for mindfulness practice. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the four bases of mindfulness practice, the three types of superior conduct should be your reply. And because I declare that even the three types of superior conduct also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment serving as the specific condition to help bring about the three types of superior conduct. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the three types of superior conduct? Restraining the sense faculties should be your reply. And because I declare how even restraining the sense faculties also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to resolutely maintain the restraint of the sense faculties. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for restraining the sense faculties? Mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, sampajanya, should be your reply. And because I declare how even mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, sampajanya, also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to continuously deepen and develop sati and sampajanya. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for mindfulness and full awareness of the body? Wise radical attention, yoniso manasikara, should be your reply. And because I declare how even wise radical attention also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, 
serving as the specific condition to resolutely maintain wise radical attention. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for wise radical attention? Possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart should be your reply. And because I declare how even possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to strengthen the faith and confidence one possesses within the heart. And what is the specific condition that serves as a nourishment for possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart? Paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma should be your reply. And because I declare how even paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma. And what is the specific condition that serves as a nourishment for paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma? Associating with truly good spiritual friends should be your reply. Thus, bhikkhus, by associating with truly good spiritual friends, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you pay close attention and carefully listen to the true Dhamma. And by paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you come to possess strong faith and confidence within your heart. Therefore, bhikkhus, by associating with truly good spiritual friends, itself fulfills the necessary condition for wanting to pay close attention and carefully listen to the true Dhamma. And paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma fulfills the requisites for developing and gaining much faith and confidence within the heart. Thus, possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart in turn fulfills the necessary conditions whereby you then have wise radical attention. And because of the presence of wise radical attention, you would then be fulfilling the necessary conditions for there to be mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, sampajanya, throughout your living experience. Now, due to the fact that there is sati and sampajanya, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you develop and maintain restraint over your sense faculties. And because of you restraining your sense faculties, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions for the three types of superior conduct to manifest in your behavior. Then, as a result of your behavior being dictated by the three types of good and superior conduct, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby the four bases of mindfulness practice, satipatthana, come to pervade your heart and stay with you wherever you are. Now, in the presence of the four bases of mindfulness practice pervading throughout your entire life, then you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby the seven factors of awakening manifest as they bring a state of true balance in your mind. Now, in the presence of the seven factors of awakening, bringing your entire life into balance, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby true knowledge and release manifest by rising within the heart. Bhikkhus, just as during heavy thunderstorms, large drops of rain fall on the higher altitudes of the mountains, where the precipitating rainwater comes pouring down as it keeps sloping its way through the valleys, filling up the small streams, that in turn become bigger streams, and thus fill up the small ponds 
The smaller ponds then become full and turn into larger ponds, turning into the rivulets that flow downwards, and then they too come to fill up the rivers that then turn into great rivers, flowing all the way into the great ocean, filling it up perpetually. So you see, bhikkhus, how even the great ocean must have its own supportive nourishment, which ensures that the necessary conditions are there for the ocean to exist. In just the same manner, bhikkhus, associating with truly good spiritual friends itself fulfills the necessary condition for wanting to pay close attention and carefully listen to the true Dhamma. And paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma fulfills the requisites for developing and gaining much faith and confidence within the heart. Thus, possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart in turn fulfills the necessary conditions whereby you then have wise radical attention. And because of the presence of wise radical attention, Yoniso Manasikara, you would then be fulfilling the necessary conditions for there to be mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, sampajanya, throughout your living experience. Now due to the fact that there is sati and sampajanya, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you develop and maintain restraint over your sense faculties. And because of you restraining your sense faculties, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions for the three types of superior conduct to manifest in your behavior. Then, as a result of your behavior being dictated by the three types of good and superior conduct, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby the four bases of mindfulness practice come to pervade your heart and stay with you wherever you are. Now in the presence of the four bases of mindfulness practice, satipatthana, pervading throughout your entire life, then you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby the seven factors of awakening manifest as they bring a state of true balance in your mind. And in the presence of the seven factors of awakening, bringing your entire life into balance, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby true knowledge and release manifest by arising within the heart. Tanha Sutta on Craving Bhikkhus, it is not possible to designate or trace a specific point in time for when the craving for re-becoming suddenly began, as in, before this there was no such thing as craving for re-becoming, hence it only manifested after that point in time. Yet, because the fact remains that there is craving for re-becoming in the presence of certain conditions. Now, bhikkhus, I declare how even craving for re-becoming also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to bring forth the manifestation of craving for re-becoming. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for craving for re-becoming? Ignorance should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare even ignorance itself does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment serving as the specific condition to bring forth the manifestation of ignorance. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for ignorance? The five obstructions, the panchanivarana, should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare even the five obstructions also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. 
Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to bring forth the manifestation of the five obstructions. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the five obstructions? The three types of wrong conduct in one's behavior should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare even the tr three types of wrong conduct in one's behavior also do not manifest without having their own requisite condition. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to bring forth the manifestation of the three types of wrong conduct in one's behavior. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the three types of wrong conduct in one's behavior? Not restraining the sense faculties should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare that not restraining the sense faculties also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment serving as the specific condition to bring forth the manifestation of not restraining the sense faculties. And what is the re specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the not restraining the sense faculties? Lacking in mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, sampajanya, should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare that the lack in sati and sampajanya also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to bring about the lack in sati and sampajanya. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the lack in sati and sampajanya? Unwise radical attention. Ayuniso manasikara should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare that unwise radical attention also does not manifest without having its own requisite condition. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to bring about unwise radical attention. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for unwise radical attention? Not possessing strong faith or confidence within the heart should be your reply. But because I declare that not possessing strong faith or confidence within the heart also does not manifest without having its own requisite condition. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment serving as the specific condition to not possess strong faith or confidence within the heart. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for not possessing strong faith or confidence within the heart? Not paying attention nor listening to the true Dhamma should be your reply. But bhikkhus, I declare that not paying attention nor carefully listening to the true Dhamma also does not manifest without having its own requisite condition. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to not be paying attention nor carefully listening to the true Dhamma. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for not paying attention nor listening to the true Dhamma? Not associating with truly good spiritual friends should be your reply. In this way, bhikkhus, by not associating with truly good spiritual friends, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you neither pay attention nor carefully listen to the true Dhamma. Thus, by neither paying attention nor carefully listening to the true Dhamma, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you do not possess strong faith nor confidence within your heart. Not possessing strong faith or confidence, in turn, fulfills the necessary conditions whereby you then have unwise radical attention. 
because of the presence of unwise radical attention, you would then be fulfilling the necessary conditions for there not to be any mindfulness, sati, or full awareness of the body, sampajanya. Now, due to the fact that there is no sati and sampajanya, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you no longer have any restraint over your sense faculties. And because of you not restraining your sense faculties, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions for the three types of wrong conduct to manifest in your behavior. Then, as a result of your behavior being dictated by the three types of wrong conduct, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby the five obstructions, the panchanivarana, come to infect your heart and all that you do. Now, in the presence of the five obstructions running your life, then you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby ignorance manifests as it dominates your entire life, which itself is the very condition that comes to fulfill the requisite for there to be the craving for re-becoming nestled within the hearts of beings. Bhikkhus, just as during heavy thunderstorms, large drops of rain fall on the higher altitudes of the mountains, where the precipitating rainwater comes pouring down, as it keeps sloping its way through the valleys, filling up the small streams that in turn become bigger streams, and thus fill up the small ponds, the smaller ponds becoming full and turn into larger ponds, as they become the rivulets that flow downwards, and then they too come to fill up the rivers, and then into great rivers, flowing all the way into the great ocean, filling it up perpetually. So you see, Bhikkhus, how even the great ocean must have its own supportive nourishment, which ensures that the necessary conditions are there for the ocean to exist. In just the same manner, Bhikkhus, by not associating with truly good spiritual friends, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions, whereby you neither pay attention to nor carefully listen to the true Dhamma. Thus, by neither paying attention nor carefully listening to the true Dhamma, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions, whereby you do not possess strong faith or confidence within your heart. Not possessing strong faith or confidence, in turn, fulfills the necessary conditions, whereby you then have unwise radical attention. Because of the presence of unwise radical attention, you would then be fulfilling the necessary conditions for there not to be any mindfulness, sati, or full awareness of the body, sampajanya. Now, due to the fact that there is no sati and sampajanya, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions, whereby you no longer have any restraint over your sense faculties. And because of you not restraining your sense faculties, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions for the three types of wrong conduct to manifest in your behavior. Then, as a result of your behavior being dictated by the three types of wrong conduct, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions, whereby the five obstructions come to infect your heart and all that you do. Now, in the presence of the five obstructions running your life, then you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby ignorance manifests as it dominates your entire life, which itself is the very condition that comes to fulfill the requisites for there to be the craving for re-becoming nestled within the hearts of beings. However, because I also declare how true knowledge and release also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition whereby true knowledge and release manifest by arising within the heart. 
And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for true knowledge and release? The seven factors of awakening should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare that even the seven factors of awakening also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to activate and maintain the seven factors of awakening. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the seven factors of awakening? The four bases for mindfulness practice, Satipatthana, should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare how even the four bases for mindfulness practice also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to activate and maintain the four bases for mindfulness practice. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the four bases of mindfulness practice? The three types of superior conduct should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare that even the three types of superior conduct also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to help bring about the three types of superior conduct. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for the three types of superior conduct? Restraining the sense faculties should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare how even restraining the sense faculties also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to resolutely maintain the restraint of the sense faculties. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for restraining the sense faculties? Mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, sampajanya, should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare how even mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, sampajanya, also do not manifest without having their own requisite conditions. Hence, they are supported and maintained by their own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to continuously deepen and develop sati and sampajanya. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for mindfulness and full awareness of the body? Wise, radical attention. Yoniso manasikara should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare how even wise, radical attention also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment serving as the specific condition to resolutely maintain wise radical attention. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for wise radical attention? Possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare how even possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to strengthen the faith and confidence one possesses within the heart. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart? Paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma should be your reply. And bhikkhus, I declare how even paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma also does not manifest without having its own requisite conditions. Hence, it is supported and maintained by its own nourishment, serving as the specific condition to paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma. And what is the specific condition that serves as the nourishment for paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma? Associating with, 
truly good spiritual friends should be your reply. Thus, bhikkhus, by associating with truly good spiritual friends, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you pay close attention and carefully listen to the true Dhamma. And by paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you come to possess strong faith and confidence within your heart. Therefore, bhikkhus, associating with truly good spiritual friends itself fulfills the necessary condition for wanting to pay close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma. And paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma fulfills the requisites for developing and gaining much faith and confidence within the heart. Thus, possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart, in turn, fulfills the necessary conditions whereby you then have wise radical attention. And because of the presence of wise radical attention, yoni somanasikara, you would then be fulfilling the necessary conditions for there to be mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, sampajanya, throughout your living experience. Now, due to the fact that there is sati and sampajanya, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you develop and maintain restraint over your sense faculties. And because of you restraining your sense faculties, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions for the three types of superior conduct to manifest in your behavior. Then, as a result of your behavior being dictated by the three types of good and superior conduct, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby the four bases of mindfulness practice, satipatthana, come to pervade your heart and stay with you wherever you are. Now, in the presence of the four bases of mindfulness practice pervading throughout your entire life, then you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby the seven factors of awakening manifest as they bring a state of true balance in your mind. Now, in the presence of the seven factors of awakening bringing your entire life into a balance, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby true knowledge and release manifest by arising within the heart. Bhikkhus, just as during heavy thunderstorms, large drops of rain fall on the higher altitudes of the mountains, where the precipitating rainwater comes pouring down as it keeps sloping its way through the valleys, filling up the small streams, that in turn, become bigger streams and thus fill up the small ponds. The smaller ponds become full and turn into larger ponds, turning into the rivulets that flow downwards and then they too come to fill up the rivers and then turning into great rivers themselves, flowing all the way into the great ocean, filling it up perpetually. So you see, Bhikkhus, how even the great ocean must have its own supportive nourishment, which ensures that the necessary conditions are there for the ocean to exist. In just the same manner, Bhikkhus, associating with truly good spiritual friends itself fulfills the necessary condition for wanting to pay close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma. And paying close attention and carefully listening to the true Dhamma fulfills the requisites for developing and gaining much faith and confidence within the heart. Thus, possessing strong faith and confidence within the heart in turn fulfills the necessary conditions whereby you then have wise radical attention. And because of the presence of wise radical attention, you would then be fulfilling the necessary conditions for there to be mindfulness, sati, and full awareness of the body, sampajanya, throughout your living experience. Now, due to that fact that there is sati and sampajanya, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby you develop and maintain restraint over your sense faculties. 
And because of you restraining your sense faculties, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions for the three types of superior conduct to manifest in your behavior. Then, as a result of your behavior being dictated by the three types of good and superior conduct, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions, whereby the four bases of mindfulness practice come to pervade your heart and stay with you wherever you are. Now in the presence of the four bases of mindfulness practice, the Satipatthana, pervading throughout your entire life, then you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions, whereby the seven factors of awakening manifest as they bring a state of true balance in your mind. Now in the presence of the seven factors of awakening, bringing your entire life into balance, you would be fulfilling the necessary conditions whereby true knowledge and release manifest by arising within the heart. Nitangata Sutta, Attaining to Perfection Bhikkhus, those who have finally come to understand and now see the truth in all things, have gained the fruits of this dispensation. Now bhikkhus, out of these individuals, five attain to perfection in this very life, while the other five become perfected by going beyond this realm altogether. And who are the ones making up the first five who attain to perfection in this very life? The one who, at the most, has seven more lives until attaining arahantship. The one who still has to roam from family to family two or more times until attaining arahantship. The single cedar who discovers that it only took him one more birth to attain final nibbana, i.e. arahantship. The once returner and the arahant who attains to perfection right here in this very birth. These are the five who attain to perfection in this very life. And who, bhikkhus, are the five who become perfected by going beyond this realm altogether? The one who attains the release that is Nibbana Supreme while in the interval state, right after the death of this body. The one who attains the release that is Nibbana Supreme upon landing in the pure abodes of the Anagamins. The one who attains the release that is Nibbana Supreme with ease while in the pure abodes. The one who attains the release that is Nibbana Supreme through exertion and effort while in the pure abodes. And the one who will be moving upstream having already landed in the pure abodes, and thus reappear in the Akanita heaven, where he attains the release that is Nibbana supreme. These are the five who become perfected by going beyond this realm altogether. Therefore, bhikkhus, those who have finally come to understand and now see the truth in all things have gained the fruits of this dispensation whereby five attain to perfection in this very life, while the other five become perfected by going beyond this realm altogether. Avicapasana Sutta Possessing Unshakable Faith Bhikkhus, I declare that whoever possesses unshakable faith and confidence in me is in fact a stream winner. Now, of those who are declared as having thus entered and won the stream, five attain to perfection in this very life, while the other five become perfected by going beyond this realm altogether. And who are the ones making up the first five who attain to perfection in this very life? The one who, at the most, has seven more lives until attaining arahantship the one who still has to roam from family to family two or more times until attaining arahantship, 
the single seater, who discovers that it only took him one more rebirth to attain final Nibbana, the once returner, and the Arahant, who attains to perfection right here in this very birth. These are the five who attain to perfection in this very life. And who, because are the five who become perfected by going beyond this realm altogether? The one who attains the release that is Nibbana Supreme while in the interval state, right after the death of this body. The one who attains the release that is Nibbana Supreme upon landing in the pure abodes of the Anagamins. The one who attains the release that is Nibbana Supreme with ease while in the pure abodes. The one who attains the release that is Nibbana Supreme through exertion and effort while in the pure abodes. And the one who will be moving upstream having already landed in the pure abodes and thus reappear in the Akanita heaven where he attains the release that is Nibbana Supreme. These are the five who become perfected by going beyond this realm altogether. Therefore, bhikkhus, I declare that whoever possesses unshakable faith and confidence in me is in fact a stream winner. And as such, among those who are declared as having thus entered and won the stream, five attain to perfection in this very life, while the other five become perfected by going beyond this realm altogether. Patama Sukha Sutta on Happiness, Part 1 Once the Venerable Sariputta was dwelling in a village among the Magadan people at Nalakagamaka. Then the wandering ascetic Samandakani came and approached the Venerable Sariputta and after exchanging friendly greetings sat to one side and said, Friend Sariputta, how do you define happiness? What is it? And what is suffering? Friend, to re-become again in the future or be reborn into any form is suffering, whereas to never re-become nor be reborn into any form is itself happiness. After all, friend, when there is future birth, then these painful experiences become unavoidable certainties, such as having to endure the cold or heat, or face hunger or thirst, having to worry about eliminating or defecating the contents of your intestines, as well as to urinate, being sensitive to the touch of fire, enduring punishments of all sorts, such as rods, sticks, and the menacing blows of weapons, not to mention having to deal with relatives and friends who make a lot of fuss and add more frustration into your life by telling you what to do and how to be in order for you to be accepted. So, you see, friend, when there is re-becoming in the future or when one is reborn into any form, all these unavoidable and painful experiences this suffering is to be expected. But, friend, when there is no more future birth, then there is a complete absence of the painful experiences I just mentioned, which means there is no more a case where one has to endure the cold or heat or face hunger or thirst, no more having to worry about eliminating or defecating the contents of your intestines, as well as no more a need to urinate, no sensitivity to the touch of fire, no more enduring punishments of any sorts, such as rods, sticks, nor the menacing blows of any weapons, and most certainly no more having to deal with relatives or friends to be making any fuss to add more frustration into your life or trying to tell you what to do and how to be in order for you to be accepted. So you see, friend, when there is no re-becoming in the future 
and one is never to be reborn into any form, then all painful experiences whatsoever are abolished, where only happiness is to be expected. Dutiya Sukha Sutta on Happiness, Part 2 At another time, while the Venerable Sariputta was dwelling in a village among the Magadan people at Nalaka Gamaka, then the wandering ascetic Samandakani came and approached the Venerable Sariputta, and after exchanging friendly greetings, sat to one side and said, Friend Sariputta, what is happiness according to this Dhamma and Vinaya? How do you define it? And what exactly is suffering? Friend, being discontented and dissatisfied with the life you are living is seen as suffering according to this Dhamma and Vinaya, whereas its opposite, as in when you experience contentment and satisfaction, that is happiness. In this way, whenever there is discontent or dissatisfaction, while walking, then one neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While standing, then one neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While sitting, then one neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While lying down, one neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While being around people or in the village, then one neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While being secluded or by oneself in the forest, then one neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While sitting alone by the roots of trees, then one neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While being in an empty kuti, alone, one neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While sitting in an open space outside, then one still neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While sitting alone with other bhikkhus, one still neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. In this manner, friend, to be discontented and dissatisfied with the life you are living is seen as suffering according to this Dhamma and Vinaya. However, friend, when you experience contentment and satisfaction while walking, then one experiences both an easing comfort and a sense of happiness. While standing, then one experiences both an easing comfort and a sense of happiness. While sitting, then one neither experiences easing comfort nor a sense of happiness. While lying down, then one experiences both an easing comfort and a sense of happiness. While being around people or in the village, one experiences both an easing comfort and a sense of happiness. While being secluded or by oneself in the forest, then one experiences both an easing comfort and a sense of happiness. While sitting alone by the roots of trees, then one experiences both an easing comfort and a sense of happiness. While being in an empty kuti, alone, then one experiences both an easing comfort and a sense of happiness. While sitting in an open space outside, then one experiences both an easing comfort and a sense of happiness. While sitting along with other bhikkhus, then one experiences both an easing comfort and a sense of happiness. Thus, friend, to be contented and satisfied with the life you are living is seen as happiness, according to this Dhamma and Vinaya. Patama Nalakapana Sutta at Nalakapana, Part 1. At one time, the Blessed One was walking in the country of Kosala with a large Sangha of bhikkhus. When he approached the Kosalan town of Nalakapana, there the Blessed One stayed in the forest 
outside the vicinity of Nalakapana. As it was the full moon day of the Uposata, the Blessed One was seated while being surrounded by the Sangha of Bhikkhus, where he kept on stirring and encouraging the Bhikkhus, inspiring and lightening their hearts and minds with a gladdening talk on the Dhamma, as he went on instructing throughout the whole night. Then, while scanning over and looking at those bhikkhus, quietly sitting there, the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Sariputta and said, Sariputta, this Sangha of bhikkhus is free from drowsiness and procrastination. So, continue to advise and instruct the bhikkhus, Sariputta, my back is aching and I need to now lie down and rest for a bit. Yes, of course, Pante, replied the venerable Sariputta. And the Blessed One folded his robes into four and laid it on the ground, with his body turned to its right side, as he assumed the lion's posture by keeping one leg folded over the other having set the appropriate time for him to wake up from his rest, while maintaining mindful awareness. Then the Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus. Friends, bhikkhus. Yes, friend, they replied, and the Venerable Sariputta continued. Friends, when someone is empty of faith in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who does not have any sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who also lacks any wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who also lacks the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, and who does not possess any wisdom nor seeks to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further decline, degeneration, and falling behind, and not development in wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior. It is just like when the moon is in its waning stage, when the sun has set, all that could be expected will be the night becoming darker, where things continue becoming less and less visible, for the moon would be losing its luster, its brilliance, and its size. In the same manner, friends, when someone is empty of faith in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who does not have any sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who also lacks any wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who lacks the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, and who does not possess any wisdom nor seeks to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further decline, degeneration, and falling behind, and not development in wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior. Therefore, friends, when a person lives without faith in his heart, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When a person lives without a sense of wise moral shame, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When a person lives without a sense of wise moral fear, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When a person lives a lazy and irresponsible life, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When a person lives unwisely, 
then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When a person lives angrily, living a resentful life, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When a person lives a hostile and harmful life, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When a person lives with evil intentions, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When a person associates with evil friends, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When a person lives while holding on to and following his wrong views, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. However, friends, when someone has a heart with a strong faith in wanting to further develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who possesses the sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who also has wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who applies the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, and who possesses the wisdom that seeks to develop further wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further growth, progress and evolution in the development of wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him. It is just like when the moon is in its waxing stage, where although the sun may have already set, but one could easily see things at night due to the brightness of the moon, where things continue becoming more and more visible, for the moon would be increasing in its luster its brilliance, and its size. In the same manner, friends, when someone has a heart with a strong faith in wanting to further develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who possesses the sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who also has a wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who applies the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, and who possesses the wisdom that seeks to develop further wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further growth, progress, and evolution in the development of wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him. Therefore, friends, when a person lives with faith in his heart, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral shame, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral fear, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives a resolute and responsibly driven life, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives wisely, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person does not live angrily and instead lives a life that is infused with metta, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth progress, and evolution. When a person lives without hostility nor wishing harm unto others, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives without any evil intentions, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person associates with good and spiritually evolved companions, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives while holding on to and following right view, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. 
It was at this point that the Blessed One arose from having rested as he addressed the Venerable Sariputta. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sariputta. For truly, the one who is empty of faith in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who does not have any sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who also lacks any wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who lacks the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, and who does not possess any wisdom, nor seeks to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further decline, degeneration, and falling behind, and not development in wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior. It is just like when the moon is in its waning stage, when the sun has set, all that could be expected will be the night becoming darker, where things continue becoming less and less visible, for the moon would be losing its luster, its brilliance, and its size. In the same manner, Sariputta, when someone is empty of faith in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who does not have any sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who also lacks any wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who lacks the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, and who does not possess any wisdom nor seeks to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further decline, degeneration, and falling behind, and not development in wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior. Therefore, Sariputta, when a person lives without faith in his heart, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When a person lives without a sense of wise moral shame, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind. Sariputta. When a person lives without a sense of wise moral fear, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind. Sariputta. When a person lives a lazy and irresponsible life, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind. Sariputta. When a person lives unwisely, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind. Sariputta. When a person lives angrily, living a resentful life, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind. Sariputta. When a person lives a hostile and harmful life, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When a person lives with evil intentions, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When a person associates with evil friends, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When a person lives while holding on to and following his wrong views, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. However, Sariputta, when someone has a heart with a strong faith in wanting to further develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who possesses the sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who also has wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who applies the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, and who possesses the wisdom that seeks to develop further wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further growth, progress, and evolution 
in the development of wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him. It is just like when the moon is in its waxing stage, where although the sun may have already set, but one could easily see things at night due to the brightness of the moon, where things continue becoming more and more visible, for the moon would be increasing in its luster, its brilliance, and its size. In the same manner, Sariputta, when someone has a heart with a strong faith in wanting to further develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who possesses the sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who also has wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, who applies the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, and who possesses the wisdom that seeks to develop further wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further growth, progress, and evolution in the development of wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him. Therefore, Sariputta, when a person lives with faith in his heart, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral shame, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral fear, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives a resolute and responsibly driven life, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives wisely, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person does not live angrily and instead lives a life that is infused with metta, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives without hostility, nor wishing harm unto others, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives without any evil intentions, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person associates with good and spiritually evolved companions, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. And when a person lives while holding on to and following right view, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. Dutiya Nalakapana Sutta at Nalakapana Part 2 At one time the Blessed One was walking in the country of Kosala with a large Sangha of Bhikkhus when he approached the Kosalan town of Nalakapana. There the Blessed One stayed in the forest, outside the vicinity of Nalakapana. As it was the full moon day of the Uposata, the Blessed One was seated, being surrounded by the Sangha of Bhikkhus, where he kept on instructing, stirring and encouraging them, by inspiring and lightening their hearts and minds with a gladdening talk on the Dhamma, throughout the whole night. Then, while looking and scanning over those bhikkhus, quietly sitting there, the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Sariputta and said, Sariputta, this Sangha of bhikkhus is free from drowsiness and procrastination. Advise and continue instructing the bhikkhus, Sariputta. My back is aching and I need to now lie down and rest for a bit. Yes, of course, Bhante, replied the Venerable Sariputta. And the Blessed One folded his robes into four and laid it on the ground, with his body turned to its right side as he assumed the lion's posture by keeping one leg folded over the other, having set the appropriate time for him to wake up from his rest 
while maintaining mindful awareness. Then the Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus. Friends, bhikkhus. Yes, friend, they replied. And the Venerable Sariputta continued. Friends, when someone is empty of faith in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. Without any sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this becomes a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. And because he lacks any wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this, then, is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. Also, because he lacks the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this, then, is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. He does not possess any wisdom, nor seeks to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself. For which reason, this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. He does not pay attention, nor carefully listen to the Dhamma being taught, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself which then becomes a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. He does not retain any of the Dhamma he has heard, neither repeating nor recalling any of the Dhamma he has studied, as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself. Then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. And because he does not examine the Dhamma he has learned, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. And also, he neither practices nor trains himself in the Dhamma in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, which then becomes a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. And he lives heedlessly, careless and not interested in dedicating himself as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior. Then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. Then, friends, whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further decline, degeneration, and falling behind, and not development in wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him, all of which are clear examples of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. It is just like when the moon is in its waning stage, when the sun has set, all that could be expected will be the night becoming darker, where things continue becoming less and less visible, for the moon would be losing its luster, its brilliance, and its size. In the same manner, friends, when someone is empty of faith in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When someone is without any sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When someone lacks any wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When someone lacks the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When someone does not possess any wisdom nor seeks to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. 
when someone does not pay attention nor carefully listen to the Dhamma being taught in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When someone does not retain any of the Dhamma he has learned or heard, neither repeating nor recalling any of the Dhamma he has studied, as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When someone does not examine the Dhamma he has learned, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. When someone neither practices nor trains himself in the Dhamma in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. And when someone lives heedlessly, careless, and not interested in dedicating himself as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. It is for this reason, friends, that whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further decline, degeneration, and falling behind, and not development in wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him, all of which are clear examples of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind, friends. However, friends, when a person lives with faith in his heart, then this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral shame, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral fear, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives a resolute and responsibly driven life, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives wisely, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person pays attention and carefully listens to the Dhamma being taught in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this, then, friends, is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he retains any of the Dhamma he has heard, by repeating and recalling the Dhamma he has studied as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this, then, friends, is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he examines the Dhamma he has learned, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this, friends, then, is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he practices and trains himself in the Dhamma, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this, then, friends, is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. And when he lives heedfully with diligence, by dedicating himself as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this then, friends, is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. Then, friends, whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further growth, progress, and evolution in the development of wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him, all of which are clear examples of his growth, progress, and evolution. It is just like when the moon is in its waxing stage, where although the sun may have already set, but one could easily see things at night due to the brightness of the moon, where things continue becoming more and more visible, for the moon would be increasing in its luster, its brilliance, and its size. Thus, friends, when a person lives with faith in his heart, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. 
When a person lives with a sense of wise moral shame, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral fear, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives a resolute and responsibly driven life, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives wisely, then, friends, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person pays attention and carefully listens to the Dhamma being taught in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he retains any of the Dhamma he has heard, by repeating and recalling the Dhamma he has studied as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is an example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he examines the Dhamma he has learned, in order to develop the wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this then is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he practices and trains himself in the Dhamma in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this then is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. And when he lives heedfully with diligence, by dedicating himself as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this then is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. Then, whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further growth, progress, and evolution in the development of wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him. It was at this point when the Blessed One arose from having rested, as he addressed the Venerable Sariputta. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sariputta. For when someone lives with a heart that is empty of faith in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When someone lives without any sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When someone lacks any wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When someone lacks the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he does not possess any wisdom, nor seeks to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he does not pay attention nor carefully listen to the Dhamma being taught in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he does not retain any of the Dhamma he has heard, neither repeating nor recalling any of the Dhamma he has studied, as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he does not examine the Dhamma he has learned, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he neither practices nor trains himself in the Dhamma 
in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he lives heedlessly, careless, and not interested in dedicating himself, as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. Then Sariputta, whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further decline, degeneration, and falling behind, and not development in wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him all of which are clear examples of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. It is just like when the moon is in its waning stage, when the sun has set, all that could be expected will be the night becoming darker, where things continue becoming less and less visible, for the moon would be losing its luster, its brilliance, and its size. In the same manner, Sariputta, when someone is living with a heart that is empty of faith in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline. Degeneration and falling behind Sariputta. When someone lives without any sense of wise moral shame in regards to wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When someone lacks any wise moral fear regarding wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When someone lacks the energy and effort to strive in developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When someone does not possess any wisdom, nor seeks to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he does not pay attention nor carefully listen to the Dhamma being taught in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he does not retain any of the Dhamma he has heard, neither repeating nor recalling any of the Dhamma he has studied, as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he does not examine the Dhamma he has learned, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he neither practices nor trains himself in the Dhamma, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. When he lives heedlessly, careless, and not interested in dedicating himself, as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, then this is a clear example of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. Then Sariputta, whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further decline, degeneration, and falling behind, and not development in wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him, all of which are clear examples of his decline, degeneration, and falling behind Sariputta. However, Sariputta, when a person lives with faith in his heart, then Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral shame, then Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral fear, then Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives a resolute, and responsibly driven life, 
Then Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives wisely, then Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person pays attention and carefully listens to the Dhamma being taught in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in himself, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he retains any of the Dhamma he has heard by repeating and recalling any of the Dhamma he has studied as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he examines the Dhamma he has learned, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he practices and trains himself in the Dhamma, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this then is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he lives heedfully with diligence, by dedicating himself, as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. Then Sariputta, whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further growth, progress, and evolution in the development of wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him all of which are clear examples of his growth, progress, and evolution. It is just like when the moon is in its waxing stage, where although the sun may have already set, but one could easily see things at night due to the brightness of the moon, where things continue becoming more and more visible, for the moon would be increasing in its luster, its brilliance, and its size. Thus, Sariputta, when a person lives with faith in his heart, then Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral shame, then Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives with a sense of wise moral fear, then Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives a resolute and responsibly driven life, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person lives wisely, then, Sariputta, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When a person pays attention and carefully listens to the Dhamma being taught in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this then is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he retains any of the Dhamma he has heard by repeating and recalling any of the Dhamma he has studied as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this then is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he examines the Dhamma he has learned, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this then is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. When he practices and trains himself in the Dhamma, in order to develop wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. And when he lives heedfully, with diligence, by dedicating himself as it relates to developing wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior, this then is a clear example of his growth, progress, and evolution. Then, whether during the day or at night, what is to be expected for such a person will be further growth, progress, and evolution in the development of wholesome and good merit-making habits and behavior in him, all of which are clear examples of his growth, progress, and evolution. Patama Kathavatu Sutta Topics of Conversation, Part 1 
At one time, the Blessed One was living in the monastery offered by Anatta Pindika in Jada's Park in Savati. There, one day, many bhikkhus, on their return from their alms round, once their meal was over, went and gathered in the attendance hall, sitting with each other while engaging in all kinds of trivial and idle chatter. In this manner, those bhikkhus kept discussing childish matters, such as talking about the king and those in the royalty, robbers and thieves, chief ministers and court advisers, the military and things to do with the army. Thus, they kept talking about matters that arouses passions and fears, relating stories about battles, discussing types of food and drinks, different types of clothes and beds, flower garlands, different ointments and fragrances, issues about relatives and kin, engaging in talk about carriages and chariots, talk about villages and various towns, cities and states, talk about women and heroes, talk that very much resembles gossips at street corners and village wells, talk about those that are dead, talk about the end of the world or the size of the ocean or its end, and talking about what might happen in the future and what might not, and so on. Later, when it was evening, the Blessed One came out from his seclusion and approached the attendance hall, where he sat on the prepared seat, and then, by addressing the bhikkhus, he asked, Bhikkhus, what was it that you were discussing as you sat here, talking with one another? What was the nature of the conversation underway here in this assembly hall among you that was left unfinished? Here, Bhante, after having returned from the alms round, and when the meal was over, we came and gathered here in the attendance hall, sitting with each other while engaging in all kinds of trivial and idle chatter. In this manner, we have been discussing childish matters, such as talking about the king and those in the royalty, robbers and thieves, chief ministers and court advisers, the military and things to do with the army. And thus, we kept talking about matters that arouses passions and fears, relating stories about battles, discussing types of food and drinks, different types of clothes and beds, flower garlands, different ointments and fragrances, issues about relatives and kin. As we engaged in talk about carriages and chariots, talk about villages and various towns, cities and states, talk about women and heroes, talking that very much resembles gossips at street corners and the village wells, talk about those that are dead, talk about the end of the world or the size of the ocean or its end, and talking about what might happen in the future and what might not, and so on. Because it is neither acceptable nor appropriate for clansmen like you, who having gone forth from home life into homelessness, out of faith and your own personal choice, to be engaging in such trivial and idle chatter, discussing childish matters such as talking about the king and those in the royalty, robbers and thieves, chief ministers and court advisers, the military and things to do with the army, and thus talking about matters that arouses passions and fears, relating stories about battles, discussing types of food and drinks, different types of clothes and beds, flower garlands, different ointments and fragrances, issues about relatives and kin, engaging in talk about carriages and chariots, talk about villages and various towns, cities and states, talk about women and heroes. You shouldn't be engaging in talk that resembles gossips at street corners and the village wells, or talk about those that are dead, talk about the end of the world or the size of the ocean or its end, or talking about what might happen in the future and what might not, and so on. But, because 
There are these ten topics of conversation that you may discuss. What are these ten? Talk that involves having fewness of wishes and wanting little. Talk about being contented and satisfied. Talk about seclusion. Talk about withdrawing from being attached to others and their companionship. Talk about arousing effort. Talk about virtues. Talk about samadhi. Talk about wisdom. Talk about release. And talk about the knowledge and vision of release. Therefore, bhikkhus, these are the ten topics of conversation that you may engage in discussing. And bhikkhus, whenever you are speaking, your talk keeps hovering around these ten topics of conversation and over and over again, then your splendor would even outshine the sun and the moon. And if this can be said about those two celestial giants that are both mighty in their size and power, then what to say about those recluses of other sects when compared to you? Dutiya Katava Sutta Topics of Conversation Part 2 At one time the Blessed One was living at the monastery offered by Anatta Pindika at Jada's Park in Savati. There, one day, many bhikkhus, on their return from their arms round, once their meal was over, went and gathered in the attendance hall sitting with each other while engaging in all kinds of trivial and idle chatter. In this manner, those bhikkhus kept discussing childish matters, such as talking about the king and those in the royalty, robbers and thieves, chief ministers and court advisers, the military and things to do with the army. And thus, they kept talking about matters that arouses passions and fears, relating stories about battles, discussing types of food and drinks, different types of clothes and beds, flower garlands, different ointments and fragrances, issues about relatives and kin, engaging in talk about carriages and chariots, talk about villages and various towns, cities and states, talk about women and heroes, talk that very much resembled gossips at street corners and by the village wells, talk about those that are dead, talk about the end of the world or the size of the ocean or its end, and they engaged in talk about what might happen in the future and what might not, and so on. Later, when it was evening, the Blessed One came out from his seclusion and approached the attendance hall, where he sat on the prepared seat, and then, by addressing the bhikkhus, he asked them, Bhikkhus, what was it that you were discussing as you sat here, talking with one another? What was the nature of the conversation underway here in this assembly hall among you that was left unfinished? Here, Bhante, after having returned from the alms round, and when the meal was over, we came and gathered here, in the attendance hall, sitting with each other while engaging in all kinds of trivial and idle chatter. In this manner, we have been discussing childish matters, such as talking about the king and those in the royalty, robbers and thieves, chief ministers and court advisers, the military and things to do with the army. Thus, we kept talking about matters that arouses passions and fears, relating stories about battles, discussing types of food and drinks, different types of clothes and beds, flower garlands, different ointments and fragrances, issues about relatives and kin, engaging in talk about carriages and chariots, talk about villages and various towns, cities and states, talk about women and heroes, talk that resembles gossips at street corners and by the village wells, talk about those that are dead, talk about the end of the world or the size of the ocean or its end, and talking about what might happen in the future and what might not, and so on. Because it is neither acceptable nor appropriate for clansmen like you 
who, having gone forth from home life into homelessness and out of faith and your own personal choice, to be engaging in such trivial and idle chatter, discussing childish matters, such as talking about the king and those in the royalty, robbers and thieves, chief ministers and court advisers, the military and things to do with the army, thus talking about matters that arouses passions and fears, relating stories about battles, discussing types of food and drinks, different types of clothes and beds, flower garlands, different ointments and fragrances, or issues about relatives and kin, as you engage in talk about carriages and chariots, talk about villages and various towns or cities and states, or when you are talking about women and heroes, talk that very much resembles gossips at street corners and by the village wells, or talk about those that are dead, talk about the end of the world or the size of the ocean or its end, or talking about what might happen in the future and what might not, and so on. This won't do, Bikus. But, Bikus, there are these ten topics of conversation that you may discuss, which are praiseworthy in themselves. And what are these ten? Here, Bikus. A bhikkhu lives with few wishes or desires and enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about fewness of wishes and desires. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, whereby others will recognize you as this bhikkhu himself lives with few wishes or desires, and he enjoys speaking to other bhikkhus too about fewness of wishes or desires. Second, the bhikkhu lives with contentment in his heart and enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about being contented and satisfied at heart. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, whereby others will recognize you as this bhikkhu himself lives with contentment in his heart and he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus too about being contented and satisfied at heart. Third, the bhikkhu lives secluded and delights in solitude, as he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about seclusion and delighting in solitude. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, whereby others will recognize you as, this bhikkhu himself lives secluded and delights in solitude, and he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus too about seclusion and delighting in solitude. Fourth, the bhikkhu is not fond of being surrounded by people or companionships, as he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about not delighting in being surrounded by people, nor seeking companionships. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, whereby others will recognize you as, this bhikkhu himself is not fond of being surrounded by people or companionships and he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus too about not delighting in being surrounded by people or companionships. Fifth, the bhikkhu lives energetically and with resoluteness, as he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about living energetically and with resoluteness. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, whereby others will recognize you as this bhikkhu himself, lives energetically and with resoluteness, and he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus too about living energetically and with resoluteness. Sixth, the bhikkhu lives with virtue in his behavior, whether in private or in public, as he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about living with virtue in one's behavior, whether in private or in public. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, whereby others will recognize you as this bhikkhu himself lives with virtue in his behavior, whether in private or in public, and he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus too about living with virtue in one's behavior, whether in private or in public, about living energetically and with resoluteness. Seventh, the bhikkhu is well accomplished in his practice of samadhi, as he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about becoming well accomplished in their practice of samadhi. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, 
whereby others will recognize you as. This bhikkhu himself is well accomplished in his practice of samadhi, and he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus too about becoming well accomplished in their practice of samadhi. Eighth, the bhikkhu is well established and accomplished in wisdom as he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about becoming well-established and accomplished in wisdom. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, whereby others will recognize you as, this bhikkhu himself is well-established and accomplished in wisdom, and he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus too about becoming well-established and accomplished in wisdom. Ninth, the bhikkhu is accomplished, firmly anchored in his attainment of release, as he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about becoming accomplished and firmly anchored in the attainment of release. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, whereby others will recognize you as this bhikkhu himself is accomplished, firmly anchored in his attainment of release and he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus too about becoming accomplished and firmly anchored in the attainment of release. Tenth, the bhikkhu is well accomplished and firmly established in both the knowledge and vision of release, as he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus about becoming well accomplished and firmly established in both the knowledge and vision of release. This in itself is a praiseworthy quality to possess, whereby others will recognize you as this bhikkhu himself is well accomplished and firmly established in both the knowledge and vision of release, and he enjoys talking to other bhikkhus too about becoming well accomplished and firmly established in both the knowledge and vision of release. These bhikkhus are therefore the ten things that are praiseworthy indeed to be discussing. Sato, Sato, Sato.